All right, we welcome you back to Bible 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, brought to you by the New Covenant College, taught here at the Institute at the New Testament Baptist Church in Dover, Tennessee. What I want to do tonight is kind of pick up from where we left off last week and uh, continue on in that same vein. We ended last week talking about the doctrine of providential preservation. And there were three things that we noted as central components of providential preservation. The first was that providential preservation follows the logic of faith because it teaches that preservation is the logical faith-based conclusion of inspiration. You'll remember that we said that inspiration presupposes preservation. It is illogical to believe that God would inspire His Word and then allow it to fall away. No, but what we believe is that everything that God has inspired, He has likewise preserved. So that's the first component of providential preservation, that it is logical on a faith-based system. Secondly, providential preservation teaches that God has preserved His exact words not just his thoughts and ideas. He's preserved his exact words, not just his thoughts and ideas. Thirdly, God's people have possessed a perfectly preserved copy of God's word in every age. And this is the point that makes providential preservation distinct from all other views of preservation. Uh, it's very important to having a believing bibliology. And so we're going to spend this evening, this lecture, fleshing that out, the basis and the implications of believing that God's people in every age have had a copy of God's perfectly preserved Word. Uh, if you understand this point, the rest of your bibliology will come together. And so there's some confusion on what we mean by this, and there's some confusion on what this entails. So we're going to get into that this evening and hopefully clear up some of the confusion that you might have. A lot of people think that when we say that, that uh, we mean that everybody in every age has had a leather-bound printed edition of God's Word. But that's not what we mean when we say that God's people have in every age possessed a copy of God's perfectly preserved Word. But what we simply mean is that His Word has never fallen away and His people have always been able to identify His complete Word. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean, in fact it doesn't mean that they had a printed edition, leather-bound, calfskin edition of God's Word. Uh, so we're titling this concept, this is a, a title I've given to, to this concept, uh, the perpetual manifestation of Scripture. The perpetual manifestation of Scripture. Perpetual manifestation. And, and what do we mean by that? Well, the word perpetual, you'd understand it's, it's continuing, it's abiding, it's, it's not ending, it's, it's going on, uh, unbroken. And manifestation, meaning that God's Word has revealed itself or manifested itself to God's people, and this is something that has been done perpetually. Okay, so uh, God's Word has always revealed itself to God's people people. Uh, what are the implications of perpetual manifestation? What, what is the basis of perpetual manifestation of the Scripture? Well, first I want you to note that perpetual manifestation is a product of this logic of faith that we've been using thus far in the course. This is what we've based our entire class off of thus far, and we're not going to depart from it here at this point. See, we affirm preservation because we affirm inspiration. And we affirm the perpetual manifestation of the Scripture because we uh, affirm the preservation of the Scripture. Because God has preserved His Word in all ages, it is a logical, faith-based conclusion to affirm that God's preserved Word is found in the text possessed and received by God's people. Okay, 
You want to know what, what, where was the preserved word of God in the 6th century? Well, what text did God's people have in the 6th century? And that's where the preserved word of God is. Why? Because it is illogical to say that God preserved his word, but hid it from his people so that they didn't have access to it. Just like preservation would be pointless, or inspiration would be pointless if it wasn't preserved, so too would preservation be pointless if it was not manifested to God's people. What good would it have done for God to have preserved his word for 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years, yet all that time it was hidden away in the sand or in a cave or in a library somewhere? There's no point of preserving his word if he's not going to manifest it to his people. Also, I want you to note that perpetual manifestation is both a scriptural view and a historical view. We see it scripturally in Jesus' commission to his church. Remember what he said there in Matthew 28. We're to go into all the world. We're to teach all nations. We're to baptize the converts. And then we're to teach them to observe all things that Jesus has commanded what are the all things that Jesus has commanded? Is it not the Word of God? Is it just limited to the sayings that Jesus made in His earthly ministry? Are we not to teach them the entire counsel of God's Word? Are we not to teach new converts the book of Genesis? Because, well, Jesus didn't say that during His earthly ministry. Are we not to teach them the epistles of Paul because that's not something Jesus commanded during His earthly ministry? No, that's, that's foolishness. The entire Word of God is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the eternal Logos. He is the living Word. So all of this, all of our Bible is to be taught to all nations. Well, let me ask you a question. How can the church teach the discipled nations all things that Jesus commanded them if they don't possess all things that Jesus commanded them? See, if God's preserved Word was not accessible to His people... They couldn't fulfill the Great Commission. Therefore, we believe that Jesus has ensured that the Word of God has been preserved and manifested to His church. But we also see this historically uh, as, a, as a view held by our ancestors in the faith. We find that this is the view taught and believed by our Baptist ancestors in the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 where they said this about the Word of God. They said, being immediately inspired by God and by His singular care and providence, kept pure in all ages, that is, preservation, it is therefore authentic. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal to them. What's the them? It's the inspired and preserved Word of God. Well, let me ask you another question. How can the church appeal to the scriptures in all ages if they don't have the scriptures in all ages. So we see there that both in the scriptures and also historically, God's people have received this promise that God's word has never fallen away and that God's people have always possessed it. So the teaching that the church didn't possess the complete and perfectly preserved word of God until 1611, for instance, or until the 1800s, or whenever, is heterodox. If you believe that there was ever a time in which uh, God didn't preserve His Word and He waited for a thousand years or for 1,600 years and then He preserved His Word and there wasn't a preserved copy of His Word before then, you're going against the teachings of Scripture, what can be deduced from Scripture, and you're also going against uh, that which has historically been confessed by Christians throughout the ages. It's a very serious thing. I want to talk a little bit about perpetual manifestation and the principle of self-authenticity. Self-authenticity. What is that? That is a big compound word. And we use this word uh, to clear up perhaps some confusion about what we mean by perpetual manifestation. You say, okay, well, I, I can receive the idea that God's people have always had a perfect copy of God's Word. 
Uh, but does that mean that there were no corruptions in existence? Does that mean there were no false writings, false books that were perhaps some believe they were Scripture, but they weren't Scripture? Well, it doesn't mean that at all. Perpetual manifestation does not preclude the fact that there were also corrupt manuscripts in existence uh, for virtually as long as the churches had the true Scripture, perversions have been circulated as well. So what do we do with those perversions? See, we're positing that the preserved Word of God is identified by that which the church has historically received. So how do we know? that Christians have not either mistakenly received something that's not Holy Scripture or have uh, either mistakenly received something uh, that's not Holy Scripture or they've left out something that is Scripture. How do we know that these errors that were in existence were not accidentally received by the church? How do we know that? And that brings us to the principle of self-authenticity. This is another view that we can see scripturally and we can see historically. Historically, we find it also confessed in our confession uh, where uh, paragraph 5 of chapter number 1 says this. It's a very important paragraph. It says this, We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church of God to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scriptures and the heaviness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine and the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation and other incomparable excellencies and entire perfections thereof, are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God, yet notwithstanding. So let me just sum up all of that. So far, that, that paragraph uh, has said that there's a bunch of really good reasons to receive the Bible as the Word of God. The consistency of it, the message of it, the excellency of it, the majesty of it are all wonderful reasons to receive the Bible as the Word of God. But then it says, yet notwithstanding. So it's kind of saying all of these reasons are great, but the main reason, okay, the, the big reason that we receive the Bible is the Word of God, yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and the divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. The, the surest reason... The, the most definite reason, the supreme reason for receiving the Bible as the Word of God is because of the infallible work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. What does that mean? That means that there is an outward reality to the authority of the Word of God. What is that outward reality? Namely, the Word of God and God Himself bearing witness of His Word. Okay, so God authenticates the Word of God, and because it is the divine Word, it is self-authenticating. The Bible authenticates itself as the Bible, and it's done that uh, in its originals and in all of its true copies. It manifests itself and declares that it is itself the Word of God. It does this through cooperative work with the Holy Spirit, working upon the hearts of God's people. Jesus promised this work Himself in John 16 and verse 13. In John 16 and verse 13, Jesus says this, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit came after his ascension, his work in the hearts of the disciples would be to bear witness of the words of Jesus Christ himself. That's the work that the Spirit of God does in the hearts of God's people whereby we can know what is the Word of God. So that's what we mean when we say the Scripture is self-authenticating. The Scripture is self-authentic. It tells us 
what the Word of God is. It manifests itself that it is the Word of God. Okay? And self-authenticity is the faith-based conclusion of perpetual manifestation. Okay? Because the Word of God has always manifested itself to God's people, because it's always been available to God's people, we believe that that which they possessed contained and was the self-authenticating Word of God. We explain it this way. Because the Bible was inspired by God, and because the Bible has been preserved by God, and because the Bible has manifested itself to the people of God in every age, we believe that the true Word of God is to be found in the books and texts that have authenticated themselves to the church. You still with me? I'll read it one more time. Because the Bible was inspired by God, and because the Bible has been preserved by God, and because the Bible has manifested itself to the people of God in every age, we believe that the true Word of God is to be found in the books and texts that have authenticated themselves to the church. Okay, so even though you might have a text that's really old, maybe we have an extant manuscript, and we can say this manuscript comes from 300 A.D. or 400 A.D. If that's not a manuscript that the church has historically received, it is illogical to think, if it disagrees with that which the church has historically received, it's illogical to think that it contains the Word of God. For why would God preserve His Word in an extant manuscript that He kept hidden from His church for over a thousand years? So that's what we mean when we talk about the self-authenticity of the Scriptures. Likewise, let's say we have an a extant manuscript that's only a couple hundred years old. But it agrees with that which the church has historically received. There's no reason to think that that manuscript is corrupt. There's no reason to presume its corruption just because it's a relatively younger manuscript. Because our standard is not the age of the text, but the consistency of the text as it has been manifested and self-authenticated by the work of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of God's people. So if the church has received a book or a textual reading, and I'm making a distinction between books and texts, and I'll get into that later, but if the church has received a book or a textual reading as Scripture, that means they've recognized it as the Word of God for virtually all of church history, it would be illogical and inconsistent with the doctrine of providential preservation to believe that the text in question is not, in fact, the Word of God. So we don't have the time to get into uh, specific textual variants tonight, but there's a number of them that in only the last century, century and a half, have been uh, hotly debated in academia. And um, take, for instance, the long ending of Mark or John chapter number 7. Like I said, we're not going to get into the specifics. But just ask yourself this. Does it make sense, considering how the church has received those variants, those texts, those readings, as the Word of God for 2,000 years, does it make sense for us all of a sudden in the year 2021 to throw those passages out of God's Word and to say that, well, they were never really inspired. To say that God testified to, to these readings for 2,000 years and God uh, allowed His people to receive them as the Word of God for 2,000 years and then, oops, all of a sudden we come to realize that, wait a minute, these aren't the Word of God. Would God do that? Is that consistent with the logic of faith? The self-authenticity of the Scriptures teaches us that we do not have to, in 2021, reconstruct the text with the hopes that we'll produce the original. We don't have to uh, take all of the variants and put them through some scientific method with the hopes that we'll rediscover the Word of God. 
When we're considering a debated book or a debated text, we can ask the question, what is the consistent witness that God has given his people concerning this passage? God has given us that gift, uh, that great cloud of witnesses. <laughs> and we can look back and see, well, what did the, what did the people in the Re Reformation era think of this? What did the people in the Middle Ages think of this? What did the, the Antinician fathers think of this? What did the early church think of this passage? Self-authenticity means that we don't have to go looking for the Word of God because the Scriptures reveal themselves to us. Because Christians have always possessed the Scripture, and because the Scripture is self-authenticating, we can trust what our forefathers had before them was the true and complete Word of God. It's the true and complete Word of God. Now, this brings us to the next thing we want to discuss uh, because I'm already hearing the objections. You're saying our forefathers had the true and complete Word of God, so you're saying that uh, from the second century there was just a complete Bible, no questions, no questions about the books, no questions about the texts, no variants, no disputes. No, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying, I, I readily admit, there were debated books and there were debated texts, but through time and through the process, the Holy Spirit of God bore a consistent witness, and those issues narrowed themselves down. That's what we're, we're positing when we talk about self-authenticity. Um, we, we get to talk about now this thing called the, the canonical argument, the canonical argument for uh, text criticism or for, for the Word of God. Uh, see, one of the things that makes providential preservation such a complex subject is that self-authenticity adds an element of time in the, re in the revelation of preservation. Okay? There's an element of time in the revelation that is our acceptance, our recognition of preservation. There's no element of time when we talk about inspiration. We know exactly when inspiration occurred. Uh, it was when they wrote, and we can pretty much, scholars pretty much have a good idea about when most of the books of the Bible were written, right? There's, there's no argument about that. Uh, but there, is, uh, there are some fuzzy edges when we come to preservation. Now, that is not to say that anything has become uh, the preserved Word of God because Scripture doesn't become Scripture. Scripture is Scripture. But we, as God's people, have not always immediately recognized particular books and passages as Scripture. What, what do I mean by this? Well, how do we know that the Bible is the Bible? Well, God tells us, right? How do we know that, for instance, let's say the Gospel of Mark belongs in the Bible? Well, God tells us. But how does God tell us? He didn't tell us at just one point in time in history. There's no place in the Bible, by the way, where it lists the 66 books that are supposed to be in Scripture. And there was no day which God spoke from heaven and said, here's the books that are in my uh, Bible that I'm giving to you. Right? So how did God tell us what is and what is not Scripture? Well, God has chosen to give us that information through His sovereign providence by bearing witness on our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He uses the self-authenticity of the Scripture to reveal to us what is and is not Scripture. And this is something that must take place in time because our hearts beat in time. He's bearing witness upon our heart. Right, And he's doing this through his people. And because uh, we are human and we have the limitations of time, and God is using us to reveal what is and manifest what is Scripture, it must be something that takes place in time. So the process here that we're talking about, the process of self-authentication by which the Scripture manifests itself to be the Word of God can be seen historically through something called canonization uh, canonization this is the process by which we can see historically God self-authenticating his word to his people now a distinction must be made again between the ontological canon and the realized canon 
You might know that word, ontology, or ontology, ontology, how something is put together, how it is made. Ontologically, the Word of God was the canon at the very moment it was written. Okay? The Word of God was canonical the very moment it was written. Again, nothing becomes Scripture. So when we talk about canonization, we're not talking about, for instance, how the gospel of Mark became scripture. But what we're talking about is how God's people came to universally recognize the gospel of Mark as scripture. And I'm just using Mark as an example. All of the books of the Bible could use any of them as in that same example. So uh, there's no process by which scripture becomes scripture, but there is a process by which we recognize it as scripture. And that process is called canonization. Now, uh, the word canon, the word canon, uh, right here, you see it's the root for our word canonization. And it literally just means rule or principle. That's what the word means. It means a rule or principle. And we're going to discuss the process of canonization in two phases. We're going to look at the the process uh, with the books of the Bible, the books of the Bible, which we're calling the meta canon, the meta canons. So I'll write that up here as well. You have the the meta canon, which refers to the books of the Bible, and then you have the micro canon, which refers to the texts of the Bible. So the books of the Bible and the texts of the Bible, both of them were authenticated over a period of time, okay? Hang with me. It'll, it'll make sense in the end. Now, uh, there's a lot of confusion surrounding how the 66 books of our Bible came to be recognized as Scripture. I want to consider that metacanon first, the books. Some think that hardly any debate was, you know, concerning this issue was going on perhaps around the second century. They say, well, about the time the second century came, the issue was closed, no more debate on the canon, they just universally recognized the 66 books. Some people think that Constantine the Great just arbitrarily chose which books would eventually be compiled in the Bible. I'm sure if you've talked to anyone who doesn't believe the Bible, uh, that's a common myth that atheists use to try to discredit the Word of God. And they say, well, Constantine the Great in the 300s, he just picked which books would be in the Bible. Well, uh, both of those theories of canonization are false. That's not how it happened. It's, it's not as simple as we would like it to be. But it was settled over a period of time through a process that we call canonization. Now, by the end of the second century, it is true that there was a general consensus on 20 New Testament books. 20 New Testament books. These books are called the Homo Legomena. Homo Legomena. At the end of the second century, 20 books, uh, the, the, the Gospels and Acts were amongst the first to be received, and then Paul's epistles were received. Um, by the end of the second century, pretty much no one questioned that they were Scripture. However, there were an additional 13 books that were still debated. 13 books that were still debated. These books are called the Anti-Legomena. The Anti-Legomena. And amongst these 13 books, seven of them would make the cut and six of them would not. So there's 13 books they're still debating in the second century, and Christians are saying, man, are these scripture? Are these the word of God? Seven of them would eventually make the cut, six would not. The seven that would eventually wind up in the canon of scripture are these. Hebrews, James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation. Right? They're all books that are in our Bible, and rightfully so. But in the second century, there was a lot of debate over them, whether or not they were really written by the inspiration of God, whether they were Scripture. And there were six other books in the Antilegomena that were finally rejected and were not put in the canon of Scripture. These books were the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistle of Barnabas, and the Didache. Okay, so anybody heard of those books? Probably not. 
because they didn't make up in, uh, they didn't get to the canon. You might have heard of the Didache. You might have heard of the Epistle of Bartimus, maybe the Shepherd of Hermas, but the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Apocalypse of Peter, they're not very well known, and they did not make the cut, right? Now, again, the seven books that made it, it's not like they weren't Scripture and then the church just made them Scripture. No, they were always Scripture. It just took a, a while before we would recognize them as such universally. And the six books that didn't make the cut, it's not like they were Scripture and they were left out. There's no such thing as the lost books of the Bible. I know that's uh, really popular for sci-fi writers and those who would subvert the truth of the Word of God, uh, but there's no such thing as the lost books of the Bible. They were never Scripture. In the second century, there were good, godly Christians that thought, well, maybe they were, but hit, uh, over the process of self-authenticating His Word, God has consistently borne witness to His people over the last 2,000 years that really those books were not Scripture. So the question then is, well, how do we know that Christians didn't make a mistake in what they finally received as God's Word? How do we know that, that those seven, that they were right about the, the decision that they eventually made? And the six, they were right about that decision. Well, let's just look at history in light of God's promise to preserve His Word. Let's just look at what happened. And um, if we believe, as we all should, in the sovereignty of God, and in the providence of God, we should be able to clearly see what God has done in history. There should be no question in our minds. So, what did God do? Well, an argument could be made that the canon was relatively closed. That means there was uh, pretty much general consent by the time of the 5th century. But some questions concerning the anti-legomena continued well into the Middle Ages. And uh, down through the centuries, these questions about the antilegomena be began to be fewer and fewer. So there were less and less questions as we get closer to the present day. And by the time of the 1500s, the six books in the antilegomena that did not make the canon had pretty much fallen away. So you get to the year 1500 and pretty much nobody's talking about them anymore. Nobody's seriously considering whether or not they might be scripture. Why, why not? Well, because God has so governed His church through His providence and through the witness of the Holy Spirit that people just don't consider those books any longer. They're, they've fallen away. They're not preserved like the other books are. They're, there's not those accurate copies. They're not available to God's people. They're fallen away, and nobody's really asking questions about them. Uh, most Christians had also at that time received the seven books of the, the Antilogomium that did make the Scripture, but even in the 1500s there were still some questions. Uh, sometime when you, when you have a, a chance, read what Martin Luther had to say about the book of Jude and uh, about 2 Peter. Uh, Martin Luther said about the book of James, for instance, that it, it mentions nothing about the cross, it mentions nothing about the gospel, and it teaches a works-based salvation, so therefore it shouldn't be regarded as Scripture. Now Luther said that in the 1500s. Well, could you imagine somebody today showing up at your church and saying, here's what I believe about the book of Jude, or here's what I believe about the book of James. Well, you'd be taking that guy up for church discipline, right? Well, just like if somebody came and, and said, you know what, I really think that the Shepherd of Hermas is an inspired book, and it needs to be in the Bible, it needs to be preached. Well, we would say, that guy's a heretic. But he wasn't a heretic in the second century, you understand. And somebody that had some of these questions about the book of James wasn't a heretic in the 1500s. Why? Because God is still bearing witness to His Word through this process of time. But what else happened in the 1500s? Well, in the early 1500s, around the time of the Reformation, many Christians returned to that glorious truth of sola scriptura. And we've already talked about this doctrine before, but it's the teaching that Scripture and only Scripture is the final authority for God's people. And I submit that for all intents and purposes, sola scriptura finally ended the debate on the Metacanon. After Christians had really made a mass exodus back to the doctrine of sola scriptura, there were no more serious questions about the 27 books of the New Testament. Why do I say that? Why uh, sola scriptura? Why is it that that really cemented the canon? Well, how can you affirm sola scriptura 
if you don't know what is scriptura? How can you say scripture alone is our authority if you don't know what books are and are not scripture? So around the time that God led his people, this is all in the providence of God. Sola Scriptura was nothing that any reformer thought up on their own. But it was a truth that God had taught, and he saw fit in the early 1500s to open the eyes of many Christians to return to that truth. And so at the same time that God is leading his people back to Sola Scriptura, he is also submitting the canonical books. Hmm. And so, after the 1500s, we find that the debate on which books are to be received as Scripture is virtually closed. There's no one seriously questioning the 27 books of the New Testament after that. And in the confessions that came out thereafter, the 1689 and even once earlier, they affirmed the 27 books of our New Testament and the, the other 39 of the Old Testament as well. Uh, but we're just primarily considering the New Testament because we're trying to prove these doctrines of perpetual manifestation and self-authenticity. Uh, so, in the last 500 years, we've had virtually no meaningful questions to the canonical books. In the, around the same time, the Council of Trent, Rome affirmed their own canon based upon their own authority. And they asserted that the 66 books of the Bible were canonical. However, they also threw in the Apocrypha, and, and this is often overlooked, but it's very important, they asserted that the Latin Vulgate was the canonical text. The Latin Vulgate was the canonical text. So they said, 66 books, Apocrypha, and the official text is our Latin Vulgate. Well, you'll remember, Latin is not one of the original tongues, Hebrew and Greek, right? Those who dissented from Rome, the Christians who were never a part of Rome and who left Rome, they believed in the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, and they affirmed the 66 books of the Bible in their canonical forms of the Hebrew and Greek as the canon of Scripture. Why did they choose that? Because they said these books are the ones that have authenticated themselves over the period of church history. Remember, in uh, the confession, again, it's often overlooked, but they, they affirmed that it was the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament and Greek that has been providentially preserved and kept pure in all ages. And they said that specifically because Rome had affirmed the Latin Vulgate, and they wanted to make sure they were clear about affirming the books in their canonical forms as they're found in their original languages. So this is the process of canonization. What I've just given you is a brief um, 80,000 foot view of how the meta canon came to be universally recognized. And it is universally recognized. And pretty much anybody that questions the 66 books of the Bible is treading on heresy, right? So this is the process of canonization. But um, this is just the meta canon. This is just the meta canon. Uh, there is a parallel history with the text of Scripture, the microcanon. So just as we've seen the books have been agreed upon over a period of time through self-authenticity, I will argue, along with our forefathers, that the text of Scripture in its canonical form was also self-authenticated, and debate on that was also closed at the same time that the meta canon was closed, and we will get into that uh, in the next lecture. But what you, what is important for you to understand, is that God authenticates His Word through His singular care and providence. See, it's no coincidence that the six books of the Antilogomena passed away, and then the Christians returned to Sola Scriptura, which answered the remaining questions on the books that should be included in the canon. It's not a coincidence that it happened the way that it did, but it's the providence of God. So the next time someone asks you, why these 66 books? Why not 67? Why not 65? Well, you don't need to point to an ecumenical council. You don't need to say, well, in 1545 at the Council of Trent, we decide, no, you don't need to say that. You don't need to go back to Constantine the Great. You can tell them, that we have these 66 books in our Bible, no more and no less, 
because these are the books that God has manifested to the hearts of his people for over 2,000 years. These are the books, these and these only, are the books that God has revealed to his people through the work of the Holy Spirit upon their hearts and borne witness that this is his word. That's the meta canon. That's the books of the Bible. And next week we will argue that the micro canon has a very similar history. And that text is also settled at the same time that God settled the meta canon. So hope you're looking forward to that. I know I am. I pray this was a blessing to you and we will see you next week.